All right, hopefully everybody is able to see my screen um, and the font size is big enough for everybody to see. Um, as we go through this, if you have questions, um, you can type them in the chat. Um, and I'll try and monitor that periodically um, and stop. So if I'm going too fast or if there's something you don't understand, you can go ahead and stop me. Um, so this tutorial is going to focus on downloading Neon Aquatic Instrument System data or AIS data using the Neon Utilities R package. Um, we're going to look at what comes in the download, um, provide some guidance on navigating all of the documentation and metadata that comes with the download, um, separating data collected from different locations within a site using the horizontal position variable, um, and then interpreting some basic quality flags. So in order to complete this, hopefully everybody has downloaded R and preferably R Studio. Um, we will need to install two R packages, um, if you haven't already, the Neon Utilities package, um, which is the basic function that's used for accessing um, Neon data. Um, and then we're going to use ggplot um, to generate some plots of the data. So these packages are available on CRAN, um, and you can install them by install.packages, um, and then just typing the name of the package um, in parentheses. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started um, by downloading some data using Neon Utilities. Um, within the Neon Utilities package, probably um, the most used function is load by product. And so what this function does is it'll download data into your R environment from the Neon API. Um, something else cool that it will do automatically is that it stacks all of the site by month files. Um, so if you were to go onto the Neon web portal to try and download data, what you would get is a different CSV for each location within a site and each month. So if you were to download like a year's worth of data from only one location within one site, you would still get 12 different CSV files that then you would have to merge yourself. And so you can see how, you know, if you were trying to do something with multiple sites and multiple years and multiple locations worth of data, that can get really hard to do. Um, so this load by product function um, will do that automatically. Um, so before we can do that, um, just make sure that you have installed those two packages, Neon Utilities um, and ggplot. I've already done that. Um, so I'm going to skip this section of code here. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar working um, in our markdown, this little green arrow here will run the grayed out um, section of code. So we're just going to go through each section uh, one by one. And if you're following along, um, in the tutorial on the web browser, um, these will be the blacked out boxes. Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to load the two packages that we're going to use, Neon Utilities and ggplot from our library, uh, since we've already installed them. Okay. Um, so now that we've got it loaded, we can start to use the load by product function to pull data. Um, it has a couple of different inputs to this function. The first one um, is going to be the data product ID or DPID. This is um, the code for the different data products uh, that Neon has. Um, so you can find the specific data product ID for um, each data product on um, the Neon webpage data. Um, Dot neonscience.org. Um, the next uh, input is the site. So each neon site has a four letter site code. Um, so, for example, um, a Rickery River, the four letter site code is A R I K. Um, it can also be a vector of multiple sites. So, say you want to download data from a subset of the neon sites, um, you can create a list using just the sites you want. 
Um, and then if you put nothing, it defaults to all, meaning all of the sites where that data product is avail available. So if you were to put in um, an AIS, an aquatics instrument system data product number, you would get the data um, from all of the sites where that data product is collected. Uh, the next two inputs are the start date and the end date. Um, and these are the, um, they're exactly what they sound like. They're the start and end dates um, for the period of data that you want to download um, in the form of the four digit year and then the two digit month. So for example, 2017-06, all of NEON's data is stored by month. So if you want, um, you know, a larger time scale like a year, you'll need to specify a start date at the beginning of the year and an end date at the end of the year. If you want um, an interval of time that's smaller than a month, what you'll need to do is download that full month of data. Um, and then once you have it, subset it to the time period that you want. Um, if you don't put anything for the start and end date, it will default to NA, which means that all of the available data will be downloaded. Um, the next input is the package. And so this specifies um, whether you either want the basic or the expanded data package. Um, expanded data packages generally include um, additional information about data quality, um, such as individual quality flag test results. Note that not every data product has an expanded package. Um, if you put expanded and one doesn't exist, um, then it'll just give you the basic package. Uh, the next input is the release. This is a, a new input to the newer version of Neon Utilities. So if you haven't used Neon Utilities in the last year or so, um, this is a new input. This specifies the uh, release version to use. So at the um, beginning of each year, Neon uh, releases a new um, version of a static version of the data set with a DOI. Um, so that the results can be reproducible. And then at the end of the next year, any new data that was collected um, since that previous release or anything in the previous lease release that has been fixed um, will be updated in that new release. Um, and so to download the most recent release, um, as well as any provisional data, so that's like data that has been collected since the previous release, but hasn't been included um, in a new release. Um, and note that these data haven't always been QA, QC yet. That's why they're called provisional. Um, you can set the release to current. Um, if you want to save your download to somewhere, um, say, on your computer or somewhere other than the R environments, um, you can use the save path function um, to direct it somewhere. Um, it will default to whatever working directory you specify. Um, in R. Uh, the check size, you can set this to true or false. And what this does is it'll check um, the size of the file that you're about to download um, before downloading it. Uh, it will default to true. Um, this can become important, like if you're doing really big downloads, you know, like multiple years of data um, from multiple sites, um, just to give you a sense of like how long that download might take, or if you have enough um, storage space on your computer to, to save that file. Um, and then lastly is the token. Um, and so this allows you to input your unique NEON API token. Um, so you can learn more information about that on the link here. Um, but basically what the, the token does is it's a unique ID for each NEON data user. Um, it kind of allows us to uh, track who is downloading and using Neon data so that we can report that to NSF. Um, you know, it's not tracking you actually, it's anonymous. It's just that you're a unique uh, user with that um, token. Um, and so the benefit to you for signing up for a token is that you get a faster download. Um, so if you don't have a token, that's fine. Um, your download might just take a little bit longer. Um, and then there's some additional um, inputs that you can learn about. Um, on the link here or, or in that previous um, data tutorial. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and download the data that we're going to use um, for this tutorial. Um, 
as we just saw, the first thing that we're going to need um, is the data product ID. Um, and so this is in the form of data product and then the level, either one through four, indicating um, how processed that data is. So level one being the most basic data up to level four um, being products that are derived from lower level data products. Uh, for this tutorial, we're going to use what's probably the most commonly used AIS data product, which is water quality. So this includes things like um, dissolved oxygen, pH, turbidity. Uh, and so the data product ID for water quality is DP1, indicating that it's a level one data product, 20288. Um, with the two indicating that it's an aquatics data product. So anyone that's um, aquatics will start with a two. Uh, then we're gonna need our four letter neon site code. And so listed here are the four letter site codes for all of neon's 34 aquatic sites. Uh, we have 24 uh, weightable streams, uh, three large rivers, and then seven lakes. Um, so you can see a list of all of them here. Um, in this exercise, we're going to go ahead and use data just from one month um, and one neon field site, Pringle Creek in Texas from February 2020. Um, because we want to examine some of the individual quality flags, we'll go ahead and download that expanded package that includes those individual quality flags. Um, we're going to want the most current release, um, so this will be the most up-to-date data. Um, and then finally, since we're only going to download one site month of data, um, we don't need to check the file size. Uh, but again, for, for larger downloads, that's probably um, an advisable thing to do. Um, so we're going to use the load by products function. We've set our data product ID to uh, the data product ID for water quality, DP1.20288.001. We've set our site to the four letter code for Pringle Creek. We put in our start date and end date of 2020 02, because we just want that one month of data. We've specified the expanded package, the current release, um, and we've told it to, to not worry about checking the file size. So we'll go ahead and run this. What you'll see is it's finding all of the available files, it's downloading them, it's unzipping them. Um, and then what you would see is, oh, I guess you still see it, even though it's one month, here's where it's stacking. Um, so that's if we had multiple months of data, it's combining all of these um, relevant tables um, into to one file for each table um, for all of the months. All right. So let's go ahead and look at the files that were um, associated with those downloads. We can do this a couple different ways. Um, the first is to just look at the names of the files um, included in this download, um, water quality. Um, I forgot to mention, this is what we specified it as here. Um, but so if we look at the names in here, We'll see all of these different files, uh, maintenance records, readmes, issue logs, um, position files, and we'll get into what those are uh, in just a second. Um, another way to do this is we can take this list um, and load it into our global environment. And what we'll see over here in our environment is that now all of these files um, are showing. All right, so what exactly are these files and uh, why would you want to use them? Um, so the first one, the most important one, is the data file. Um, there will always be one or more data files if there is that data product available for that site and month. Um, and this includes all of the, the primary data for the data product that you download. Uh, sometimes you will get multiple data frames uh, if there are related data products. So for example, water quality, um, you'll see it's called water quality subscore instantaneous. Uh, that's because it's measured and reported 
um, as instantaneous values collected either every one minute in the weightable stream sites or every five minutes uh, in the lake sites, but it's not average. A lot of our other data products are averaged. So for example, five minute averages or 15 minute averages or 30 minute averages. And some data products will include multiple data files. So for example, uh, five minute averages and 30 minute averages. But for water quality, since it's an instantaneous and not average data product, there's just one data file. Um, so next is the sensor position file. And so you'll know all of these um, are the name of the file, an underscore, and then a number. And that number is the same five digit number that corresponds um, to the particular data product that they're related to. So what the sensor's position file does is this file, it contains information about the coordinates of where each sensor was located. Um, so if we go ahead and open it, you'll see, you'll see this shows all of the different locations within Pringle Creek where water quality was measured in different time ranges. Um, and then if you scroll over, um, you'll get lat longs um, and elevations for those. So that can be really helpful um, interpreting where um, different data was collected within a site. Um, so next is the variables file. And so this file contains all of the information about the variables found in the other tables. Um, so for example, definitions and units and other important information. So if we just look at that real quickly, um, you'll see the first column is which table is it found in? What is the field name? Um, what, is, what is the definition of that variable? Um, the type, and then if it has any units associated with it. Um, so for example, let's just go down to one that's in the actual data file. So for example, um, water quality instantaneous, the field dissolved oxygen is exactly what it sounds like, the dissolved oxygen concentration in units of milligrams per liter. Um, there's also a readme that comes with the file. Um, so this provides um, important information relative to how um, data was collected, processed, et cetera. Um, and then also many of the data products come with maintenance records. Um, so for example, this one, um, maintenance here, um, and then also cleaning and calibrations. Um, and so it'll give you um, dates for when sensors were cleaned or calibrated and then pre and post cleaning or calibration values so that if there's an offset um, in the data, you can correct that. Um, that's one important thing to keep in mind is that most um, NEON level one data products are not um, post corrected for things like thrift and calibration offsets. Um, we provide that information um, in these maintenance files um, so that you're able to do those corrections yourself. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, we kind of already did this, but let's go ahead and we'll run this here. Um, and so those files that you just looked at, the variables file, sensor position file, uh, and the data uh, file show up here. Um, one thing that's important to do is we wanna check um, the versioning of the data that we downloaded, what release did it come from? Remember, we specified it to current so that it would give us um, the most recent one. But then when we cite that, if we were to use this data in a publication and then um, cite it, we wanna know which release it came from because each release has its own um, unique DOI. So let's look within um, water quality instantaneous, the, the data file, um, what values for the release are present. Okay, so all of the data that we just downloaded came from release 2023. That's the most recent um, current release until I, I believe next week, release 2024 is now. Um, and then here's a here's a helpful link if you want to learn more about um, our data versioning and then how to appropriately reuse and cite uh, Neon data. You can go to that link. All right. So now we're gonna look at data that was collected 
from different sensor locations within a site. Um, within most of our sites, um, we collect the same type of data from sensors that are located in a couple different um, locations. Um, and all of this data gets delivered together when you use um, the Neon Utilities Load by Product function. Um, if you were to just go on the web portal and, and start downloading CSVs, um, then you would get those locations um, separately. Uh, you know, but a lot of times you're going to want to analyze data together. Um, and so if you use the load by product function, um, you're going to get those, all of those locations combined into one um, single data file. So within the data file, um, one of the ways that we indicate where within the site the data was collected from is the horizontal position variable. So let's go ahead and just look real quickly in our water quality instantaneous. Um, you'll see right here, it's the third column, horizontal position. Um, and it has a numeric code within it. And so for aquatic sites, um, that code, the HOR code or horizontal position code, um, it's always gonna be a three digit number. Uh, for our aquatic sites as of 2024, um, what the possible codes are, uh, are listed here. Um, so generally ones that end in a one are collected from an upstream location um, within a stream site. Ones that end in two are collected from a downstream location in a stream site. The earlier numbers indicate like the type of infrastructure that it's mounted on, um, whether it's like a monopod strut that's driven into the stream bed and mounted to that versus like an overhead cable system where it's hanging down um, from above. Um, for any lake and river sites where data is collected um, from a buoy, it's gonna end in three, so 103. Um, and then lastly, for our lake sites, we have a few sensors that are, mount, are uh, mounted around um, the outside of the lake, lake like in the littoral zone. Um, and so those have HOR codes of 130 through 190. Um, note that within NEON, data is also collected at different vertical positions. Um, this is true in aquatics only at the lake and river sites. Um, so where data is collected like from a buoy that's in the deepest part of the lake, we have sensors that are suspended at different depths um, to collect data so that we can create like vertical profiles of things like water temperature and water chemistry so that we can look at stratification. Um, but this tutorial, we're just using a weightable stream site um, where data is only measured um, at a single vertical position. Um, so we don't really have to worry about that. Um, but so you'll frequently want to know which sensor locations are represented in uh, the data file that you've just downloaded. And so we can do this um, by using the unique function um, to look at what unique horizontal positions are present. So we're gonna say, what are the unique um, values present in our data table, water quality instantaneous in the column horizontal position? And so we run it. And so what we see is um, at Pringle Creek in February of 2020, which is the data that we just downloaded, uh, there's only two positions present, 101 and 102. So this corresponds to upstream and downstream sensors. Uh, one thing to be careful about is that the location, even if it has the same code, the actual physical location can change over time if the site is redesigned. So that's why you'll wanna go back to this sensor position file and find um, your HOR code here, um, 101 and see for different date ranges, did the physical location change? And you'll see like for Pringle Creek, this is a creek that um, has a lot of aggradation and deposition of sediment. And so as the channel meanders, the actual physical location where the downstream sensor was had to move a little bit. So you'll see like the latitude was pretty much the same, but the longitude changed a little bit and the elevation changed a little bit 
um, as those sensors were being moved around through time so that they stayed in the foul leg of the stream. All right, so now that we know what horizontal positions are present in the data that we just downloaded, um, we can split them up into different data frames. So then we'll have uh, one data frame for all of our upstream data and one data frame for all of our downstream data. So we'll go ahead and do that. We'll create this data frame water quality up. And this is subsetting water quality instantaneous for the horizontal positions that equal 101, so the upstream location. And then we'll create a, sep a second um, data frame water quality down, um, which is the data from water quality instantaneous that has a horizontal position of 102, so the downstream location. So we'll run this. And they should pop up over here in our environment now. So within water quality instantaneous, there was a total of 8,000 or 83,520 observations. And now we've split them exactly in half were collected at the downstream location and half of them were collected at the upstream location. All right, so now we can go ahead and plot some of this data and just see what it looks like. Uh, let's plot uh, dissolved oxygen data from the, the downstream sensor. Um, something else that's really cool that NEON does with our data that other agencies like maybe USGS um, doesn't do is that we also include uncertainty estimates for most of our measurements. Um, that are derived from our calibration and validation lab. Um, so each individual sensor probe um, that we have, they test it and figure out what's the uncertainty of this probe. And that gets published with the data here. Um, so if you were to go to water quality instantaneous uh, and go over to some of the data um, right here for dissolved oxygen, it also has this column um, that includes uncertainty. So we'll go ahead and we'll plot that uncertainty along with the data. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to identify all of the columns um, that are gonna be important um, for plotting, um, the time stamp that we wanna use, and then the dissolved oxygen data. There's two ways to do this. Um, one of them is to just look at the um, unique column names. Um, Another one is to look at, remember the variables file that was gonna tell you um, what all of the different variables present in the data file are. Um, so let's just go ahead and do both of these. So we'll run back here first. Um, so these are all of the variables that are present in um, the data table water quality instantaneous. So 151 um, different variables. And so there's a lot of them here um, that correspond to dissolved oxygen. Some are called dissolved oxygen. There's sea level dissolved oxygen, saturation, local dissolved oxygen, saturation. And so if we wanted to know what all of these different variable names are, that's where we would go to this variables file. We'll find the table that we want, which is water quality instantaneous. And then in the field name, we can find each of those names. So dissolved oxygen is the dissolved oxygen concentration in milligrams per liter. If we were to go down, we can find, um, for example, local dissolved oxygen saturation. And so this is the dissolved oxygen percent saturation in percent um, relative to local conditions. So local atmospheric pressure, this will vary. Um, uh, gas saturation varies. Um, based on the temperature, obviously, but then also like the pressure. Um, so at higher elevations, you get less dissolved gas than at lower elevations. Um, and then there's also this one here, sea level dissolved oxygen. So this is reference um, to sea level pressure. So for this plot, let's just use um, dissolved oxygen, which is dissolved oxygen um, in milligrams per liter. And then we're going to plot the associated uncertainty, dissolved oxygen, expected uncertainty. Oh, also, uh, the, for our um, X variable, we want to know which, which time column we want to use. So most data products have multiple time columns. So if we go to water quality instantaneous, 
you'll see there's a start time and the end time. And so for water quality, you'll notice that these are exactly the same. And the reason for that is remember, it's an instantaneous um, data product that's only measured um, at one instant in time. And so it doesn't really matter. The start time and the end time will be the same for this data product. For other ones that are like a 30 minute average, um, the start time will be the start time of that averaging interval, and then the end time will be the end time of that averaging interval. So that's an important distinction um, to keep in mind. Um, another thing to remember is that all NEON data, the timestamps are always in UTC time, regardless of the time zone where the data was collected. Um, it's always going to be in UTC time. Um, so if you want to convert it uh, to the local time, um, there's a lot of functions in R that will do that for you. Um, but just keep in mind, like if you see, you know, the sun is coming up and it says it's, you know, 1800 hours, that's because it's 1800 hours in UTC time, not local time. All right. So we're going to create our plot of DO. We'll call it DO plot. We're going to use ggplot. Um, we're going to make a line plot. We've specified that the data we're going to use is water quality downstream. We're going to use the end date time as our X variable, dissolved oxygen as our Y variable. Um, we're going to make it blue. We're going to add a ribbon for the uncertainty. Um, again, we're going to use water quality downstream as our data and end date time as our X variable. Um, for our min, we're going to use the dissolved oxygen variable minus the uncertainty, and then for our max value, uh, we're going to use the dissolved oxygen uh, plus the inspected uncertainty. Uh, so we'll go ahead and run this to create our plot. All right, so now we've got a pretty cool plot here of our downstream DO data from Pringle Creek from February 2020 with uncertainty bounds added. Um, you know, and it looks pretty normal for a dissolved oxygen plot. Dissolved oxygen goes up during the day because of photosynthesis, and then it goes down during the night because of respiration. Um, here it's dampened probably because, you know, something happened. You know, these were, um, this was a not sunny day, or maybe there was like a high flow event that increased the turbidity or something. Um, but if we look right here, we see some kind of weird data going on here. Like there's some spikes and dips and things and kind of what's going on there. So that's what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the quality flags of the data to try and figure out what's going on um, with these spikes here. So <clears throat> Neon's data quality flags fall under two distinct types. Most of them are automated quality flags. Um, so these are things <clears throat> that get done automatically based on algorithms for the range, um, spikes or steps where the, the change from one timestamp to the next um, is quite large, um, nulls for missing data, <clears throat> and then some data products have um, data product specific automated flags. Um, there aren't any for water quality though. Um, and then the second type are manual science review quality flags. Um, so this is where somebody, probably me at Neon, has looked at this data and reviewed it and said, hey, you know, there's there's something odd going here, something odd going on here. Um, and so I'm going to add a manual quality flag to it to alert users, um, you know, that they might want to take a closer look at it before they use it. <clears throat> Um, so for instantaneous data, such as water quality flag, the flag columns are all denoted with QF for quality flag. Um, in time average data, um, those quality flags then get ag aggregated into quality metrics, um, which is just a percentage of the data within that um, average that got a quality flag. Um, and those are denoted with a QN. Um, so here, let's go ahead and look at the different um, quality flag names within water quality. And then we'll just look at the ones that correspond to dissolved oxygen. And remember that we need to remove all of those that are associated with the dissolved oxygen saturation and percent. We only want to look at um, dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter. 
So we'll go ahead and run this. Um, we'll see that within the expanded package of our um, data product water quality, there's 120 um, fields um, that are associated with quality flags. So remember there was 151 variables here. So the vast majority of them are related to quality flags. And that's because remember we downloaded the expanded data package that has all of the individual quality flags. If we were to download um, the basic package, then it would only include those 31 variables that aren't associated with quality flags. And then um, here, the final quality flag, which aggregates all of these other individual quality flags um, for each parameter. And we'll see in a second why sometimes it's important to look at the individual quality flags versus just the final quality flag. Because there might be times um, where, where these are getting triggered for a reason where the, the data isn't necessarily bad. Um, you want to look and see which individual quality flags were getting triggered before you decide whether or not to use the data um, versus if you should just download the basic package and see that the final quality flag was tripped without knowing why, um, then you might be more hesitant to, to use that data. So a quality flag of zero indicates that it passed a particular test. One indicates that it failed that test. And then occasionally you'll see a negative one, and this indicates that particular tests couldn't be performed. Um, so for example, if there were missing data, it would get a one uh, indicating a fail for the null quality flag. Um, but then for the range quality flag, it would get a minus one, right? Because you can't run a range test on a missing value. Um, and so again, the detailed quality flag showing the individual results are available in the expanded package. Um, but if we had specified basic, then we would only get this, the last final quality flag. Um, there's also these alpha and beta quality flags. And what these do is they aggregate results um, of the various quality flag tests. So in most cases, if any of the individual quality flags um, triggered a value of one indicating that it failed, um, it'll set the alpha quality flag to one. And then if there were any results um, that caused it to get a minus one, indicating that the test couldn't be run, then it'll, it will set the beta quality flag to one. Um, so let's go ahead and consider what types of quality flags for, were thrown for the data that we just looked at, the downstream dissolved oxygen at Pringle Creek for this month. So we'll go ahead and run this. So we'll see for range, um, the unique values were zero and one. So there were some that passed and some where the test couldn't be run, but there's no one here. So there were, were no values that failed the range test for being outside the range. Um, for the step flag, okay, there were a couple that failed the step flag. Um, we'll look for the null flag. Um, again, there were some that passed and some that failed. Likewise for gap, and then you can go down um, through all of these other quality flags. Um, we include some for um, calibrations. Um, so if the sensors haven't been calibrated within a specified amount of time, say um, the field science wasn't make, able to make it out to the site for the last month for some reason um, and do a calibration of the sensors, um, then these valid calibration flags um, will get triggered. Um, again, that's not necessarily or reason to a priori throw out data just because you see this quality flag has been triggered. Um, so that's why it's important to go and look um, and see what are the individual flags that have been triggered because like some data that gets quality flag um, may still be usable. Uh, and then of course the opposite is true. Sometimes some data uh, does make it through that's bad data, uh, <clears throat> but for whatever reason didn't get quality flag. So that's really why it's um, sort of on you as the user um, to review the data, understand why it is or isn't getting quality flagged, and then make a determination for yourself whether that's data that you're comfortable using. All right, so we just discussed this. So a zero value indicates um, that it passed a quality test, one that it failed, and then minus one um, that it couldn't be run. So we saw which type. Um, were happened for each quality flag. Now let's look at um, the frequency or the number of these um, individual flags. 
that were grown for this period of data. Okay, so we can see out of 41,760 total measurements within the, the uh, downstream water quality dissolved oxygen, um, there were zero that failed the range test, 23 that passed the step test, 224 for the null test, um, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so for all of these different quality flags, um, the algorithm that's used to create them and then the threshold that's used to trigger them are uh, available in what we call our ATBDs, Algorithm Theoretical Basis Documents. And so these are available for download. If you go to the NEON data portal webpage for each specific data product, you can download um, these ATBDs to get a better understanding um, of how quality flags um, are generated. Um, so we can look here, are there any manual science review quality flags? That means that somebody looked at the data and saw something um, that was wrong. Um, so we look up here, right here, dissolved oxygen, the final quality flag science review, there were zero. Um, so nobody uh, looked at this data and saw anything that was obviously wrong. Um, you know, this is the one that I, when I use the neon data that I focus on the most. Um, if the science review quality flag has been set to one, it probably means um, that there was something seriously wrong with the data, not that a, a person was able to visually recognize it. Um, but again, just because you see it set to zero doesn't always mean that there isn't something wrong. It's just, uh, you know, we collect hundreds of data products um, from 90 something sites. Um, and within each data product, um, there are dozens and dozens of variables. Um, so it's a, it's pretty much impossible for a person to visually review all of the data that we're collecting. Um, so that's why it's really on you as the user um, to note that the quality flag algorithms aren't perfect and that suspect data sometimes passes through the quality tests and other times potentially useful data might get quality flagged. Um, and ultimately it's up to you to decide which data you're comfortable using. Um, and so that's why we always recommend using the expanded data package and understanding um, why the individual quality flags are being flagged. And if you ever have any questions about it, you know, we encourage you to, to reach out to us um, who can help you better interpret data that you might not be as familiar with as we are. All right, so let's go ahead and replot the data now um, with any of the quality flag measurements set to a different color. So we're gonna create a new DO plot. Um, it's exactly the same as before. We're using our water quality downstream with our end date time as the X variable, dissolved oxygen as the Y variable, but now as, as um, for the color we've set as a factor, whether the dissolved oxygen final quality flag. Uh, when it's zero indicating that it passed all of the quality flag tests, it's gonna be blue. And if it was one indicating that it failed a quality flag test, it's gonna be red. So we'll go ahead and run it. We get a plot that's very similar to that one that we saw before, except for now these weird um, spikes and dips um, that we noticed as looking odd in the data before. Yeah, those did get, get quality flagged. Um, and so they're shown in red. All right, so we've got about 15 more minutes left of the tutorial um, before we open it up to questions. So what we'll do is we have this last section um, to apply what we've learned using a, a different data product. So for the first part, um, we'll use another popular AS data product, temperature of surface water. Um, and it has its own unique data product ID. So DP1 indicating it's a level one data product, starting with two indicating it's an aquatics data product, 0053. So knowing this other data product ID, can we download data for the same site and month that we just looked at for water quality? Uh, so we're gonna create uh, this new object here Using our load by product function, we've specified the new data product ID. We're keeping the site the same as Pringle, the month the same, 
again, we're going to download the expanded package so we can look at flags and we want the current release. So we'll go ahead and run this and load it into our environment. And if we look over here on the right, we'll see that this data product also came with sensor position files, variable files, readme's, um, followed by that same five digit data product ID. So we now have a readme for 20288 water quality and 20053 temperature and surface water, likewise issue logs, um, variable files, et cetera. All right. So let's see what horizontal positions are present in this data. Remember, we just did this for water quality to see where are the different um, locations where data was collected. Within our temperature and surface water, we had the same horizontal positions as we did for water quality, 102 and 103, indicating these measurements were um, co-located with water quality. <clears throat> um, Let's go ahead and again, we'll use just the downstream data like we just did for water quality. So we're gonna create a new data frame, temperature and surface water downstream, um, subsetting our temperature and surface water um, 30 minute with a horizontal position of 102. So note for temperature and surface water, this is an average data product. Remember, so water quality was instantaneous. If we look at temperature and surface water over here, we got a five minute average data table and a 30 minute average data table. And so if we go and look at this, at the start time and the end time, remember for water quality, these were the same because it was instantaneous. Now for this 30 minute average data product, we have a start time and then an end time that's 30 minutes later. So something important to keep in mind. All right, so we'll go ahead and split it to be just the downstream data with a horizontal position of 102. If we look over here in our environment, we now have this data frame, temperature, surface water downstream. Um, we'll go ahead and remove the quality flags. Remember I said you should always go and look at them individually. For time's sake here, we're just gonna say, we're just gonna remove any that have a final quality flag. Uh, or we're going to subset ones where the final quality flag is set to zero. So ones where the final quality flag um, wasn't triggered. In general, you usually don't want to do this, but for simplicity's sake and time's sake in the tutorial, we're going to go ahead and do that. And then we'll go ahead and plot the data. Uh, we're going to use our data, temperature and surface water downstream. Um, we have to choose here whether we want to use the start time or the end time as our X variable. A lot of times you could use the average of the two. So that's like the middle of the averaging period. Um, we're gonna use our mean surface water temperature. Um, we chose this value and we know what units it's in, presumably because we went and looked at it in the variables file. Uh, and then we can also add uncertainty just like we did um, for dissolved oxygen. So we're going to set our min equal to the value minus the uncertainty, and then our max equal to the mean plus the uncertainty. So we'll go ahead and run it. We get this nice plot here, similar to what we had before for dissolved oxygen, um, but now it's for temperature. Uh, we'll go ahead and do another example. Um, for this one, let's look at our continuous discharge. Um, so this is a higher level data product. You'll note that the number is DT4, indicating that it's a level four data product. And what that means is it's derived from lower level data products. So in the example of continuous discharge, it's derived from our level one surface water elevation data, and then also our level one AOS or aquatic observational system data uh, the field measured discharge. So periodically they go out and make handheld measurements of discharge. And from that and the, the level one water surface elevation, we can make a rating curve that predicts what is the discharge for any particular water surface elevation. And that's this higher level um, data product level four. Uh, 
So we'll go ahead and we'll download that data for the same site and month that we just looked at. Um, so we changed our data product ID to discharge. We've kept everything the same. Uh, Pringle, date, package, release, all the same. We'll go ahead and run it. Okay. Um, and it's now loaded into our environment. So over here, we'll see this new file, CSD, continuous discharge. Um, something to note, discharge is only measured at a single location, so we don't have to worry about the horizontal position. If you go in here, um, discharge is always measured at the horizontal position or horizontal ID of 110. Um, there will never be a different number in here. Um, so you don't have to worry about separating the data um, by location. And the reason for that is like our reaches are specifically chosen so that flow coming in approximately equals flow going out. Um, there can be some small groundwater interactions, um, you know, but we don't have large tributaries coming in. So discharge at any one location in the stream more or less is going to be equal to discharge at any other location. Uh, the reaches were specifically chosen for that. So let's go ahead and for our continuous discharge, remove any of the values that have um, a final quality flag, or, or rather we're going to choose the ones where the final quality flag wasn't triggered. And then we'll go ahead and plot this. Uh, so we're going to use our CSD continuous discharge. We're going to use the end date. Um, as our x variable, and then this term max post discharge here as our y variable. Again, if you want to know exactly what that is, um, you can go look in the variables file that comes with continuous discharge. Um, but basically, it's the uh, maximum posterior likelihood of this Bayesian model that we use um, to calculate discharge. It's essentially the mode. Um, the most common value. Um, we also, for continuous discharge, do provide the means and the medians if you prefer to do that. Um, but generally, we recommend using the maximum posterior because that's what the developers of the particular model that we use recommend. Uh, and then uh, we'll go ahead and also add our uncertainties here. Um, so for discharge is a little bit different. The uncertainties are the upper and lower values. It's not just an uncertain, a standard uncertainty that you would add and subtract from the actual value. Um, so when you want to use that data, that's a distinction that can be important. Um, so we'll go ahead and run this here. And here's our continuous discharge with uncertainty. And so you see there's a, a higher flow event here. Um, and that's probably, remember, when we looked at the dissolved oxygen data, um, where that clear diet signal disappeared was probably right after this flow event because it increased um, the turbidity and attenuated the light um, that was reaching the benthic surface and, and stimulating primary production. All right, um, so we've finished our tutorial. And now, oh, right on time, with three minutes to spare. And now, um, we can open up the floor for anybody that has any questions. So if you have any questions, you can either um, unmute yourself and ask them, uh, or you can type them in the chat. Um, if you have questions that like you don't want to ask in public because you're embarrassed or something, um, feel free to, to email me. Hi, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. That was a really useful seminar. Um, one of the things, and I appreciated uh, the depth you went into in talking about the flagging um, because we've been using um, some neon data and we just aren't, aren't totally sure what all the flags mean and everything. So that was really useful. And one question I had about um, the flagging and the data sets is, do you ever remove data if you feel pretty certain that the data are bad? Like if you had an instrumental error or something like that, or are all data included and then flagged? So not currently. And that was mandated by NSF. 
That is changing though. We are um, continuous discharge is now our first data product that we're going to work on both removing data that we identify as just like so bad that it can't even be used um, or trying to clean up that data um, using alternative data sources um, if we can to try and make it usable. So at the moment, no. Um, I, I guess that's not entirely true. There have been like extreme circumstances where data have been redacted, but it's been few and far between. Um, for the most part, what NSF has directed us to do um, is to manually flag data that's bad, um, but it still gets published. Which, I mean, as you just alluded to, is not a perfect solution and can lead to people misinterpreting how to use that data or whether to use that data. That's really useful. And and the discharge data is what we've been using the most and been, you know, sort of thinking hard about. I'm wondering what the time frame for this change to removing some data is and when, sh when should we expect that? And, and so, are you going to go back and do that with older data? Yeah. Uh, yes, to both questions, but on different timelines. So moving forward, starting, uh, we have published water through water year 22. We are working on water year 23, which just finished October of 23. Um, so moving forward, that data is going to be cleaned up with any bad data removed and any data that can be fixed, fixed. Um, and then we are planning to go back in time uh, to do that to data collected previous to 2023. That will take a little bit longer. I, I don't know exactly how long it might take a year or two before that happens. That's really but, useful. But Thank you so forward, much. Will be yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. That's that's really useful information. Thank you. Um, just a note that I dropped a link in the chat to a survey. So for those of you who have to drop off, we just ask that you fill that out so that we can continue to improve these offerings. I had a, a quick question, Bobby. Um, how is the uncertainty determined? I'm sure that's in the ATBD, but is that based off of sensor limitations or what? Uh, what? For, for which data product? It vary, it's different by data product. So for the level okay. one data products where it's just like sensor data that's being collected, um, that's derived by CalVal. So they test each sensor before it gets deployed by putting it in standards. Um, so they know what the measurement uncertainty is. For the higher level data products like discharge, that uncertainty comes from a couple different sources. So there's the actual uncertainty in the field measurements. So like the water surface elevation um, and then the manual measurements of discharge that they collect using the AD, ADVD. So those get incorporated. But then the Bayesian model also has its own two sources of uncertainty. So it gets priors that are based off the, the channel geomorphology. So they go out there um, with like a theodolite um, and a level rod and they measure the shape of the channel, which obviously like that and the slope of the channel controls how much water can flow through it. Um, so those serve as priors to the model. Those have uncertainties based on the measurement accuracy of the survey and then how we interpret like where the channel breaks are, like so where it goes over bank. Um, and then there's also posterior uncertainty, which is how well that model actually fits um, the observations of manual discharge. So it's like a remnant uncertainty. Uh, so discharge has multiple sources of uncertainty. And so if you actually go, um, let me share my screen again. Are you able to see my R console again? Yeah. So if you go into um, the continuous discharge um, data frame, it'll include both. So there's some with the just the parametric uncertainty. So that's like the uncertainty in the priors, and then remnant uncertainty, which combines both the um, prior and posterior uncertainty. Okay. And that's what was plotted in the lesson. The, yeah, so that's like the that's please. like combined. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what I plotted. I can't remember, but it should have been. Yeah, yeah, so I plotted. 
Thanks.